Okay, we have looked at our motive for ethics, looking at what our heart attitude should be. We've looked at ethics from the perspective of the goal or the situation or the results that we should consider. So now we're going to look at the third perspective on ethics, the law of God. Now, as we begin looking at the law, we need to consider some principles for using the law rightly. Paul told Timothy, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So that's in 1 Timothy 1.8. So we want to be sure that we're using the law properly. So first we have to recognize that the Bible uses many different types of language to communicate. It's not all just commands or laws. Do this, don't do that. There are imperatives like that, but there are also indicatives, questions, promises, prose, poetry, song, law, history, epistles, proverbs, parables, drama, symbolism, emotive expressions, and others. God teaches us through all these ways, not just in the thou shalts and thou shalt nots. We need to see how, for example, the poetic expressions of psalms or the riddles of proverbs give us ethical instructions, just the same as the law of Moses or the commands of Jesus or Paul. Now there are some things for which the law is good. First, it can outline commands and demands. That's kind of the obvious thing. It tells us what God expects of us. Notice we're talking here about commands, not suggestions. The law is not something we can take or leave as we want. The Bible, all the way through, condemns those who take away from or add to the Word. We're required to do what the Bible commands, and we're forbidden from doing what the Bible forbids. The law also tells us blessings for obedience and punishments for disobedience. The law also exposes our sin. Paul spoke of this when he said, I would not have known sin except through the law. That's in Romans 7.7. 7. Finally, the law reveals the character of God. It shows us what God says is good and bad, right and wrong, and so we learn of what God's own righteous nature is. You see, God doesn't say that something is right because it measures up to some external standard of good, but he declares something right because it's in accord with his own nature. There's no standard of right or wrong outside of God that God has to check in to see what's right or wrong. It's his own nature is the standard, and so when he declares to us what's right or wrong, it's based on his own character. But now we need to think about some important things that the law cannot do. First, it cannot justify or save the sinner. The law can tell us what's right and wrong, but it cannot do anything to forgive sins. It can only pronounce condemnation on us when we fall short. Related to this, I can't look to the law for relief from the bondage of my sin. As I look into the law, I see more and more how I have offended God and how he is angry with sinners, but I don't find relief for my bondage. And finally, the law cannot give me the power to overcome sin. I cannot conquer or root out sin in my life just by reading the law. Just because I read, Thou shalt not commit adultery, that doesn't give me the power to overcome the sin of adultery. The law is great at showing me the extent of my sin, but if I want to repent and turn from my sins, the law cannot help me. We also need to consider the concept of the Old and New Covenants regarding the law. You see, some Christians will say that the law of the Old Testament doesn't apply to us today since Christ has brought in the New Covenant. So we don't follow the Old Testament law. We only follow the commands of the New Testament. We need to think, though, about what Jesus said. Think about Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Jesus said, Do not think, and the force of that is, don't even begin to think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 
Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, Jesus here, speaking of the Old Testament law, said specifically he did not come to do away with the law. He said, don't even begin to think that I came to do that. So whatever the differences between the Old and New Testament are, they cannot be that the Old Testament law is just done away with. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. That means, it means to bring it to full force, to bring it to completion, to round it out, to fill it out. It doesn't mean fulfill in the sense of, okay, well, I've done the law, so therefore it doesn't apply. It means, no, I came to bring the law to its fullest completion, in that sense, to fulfill it. So he proceeds then to explain that through the next verse. He tells us what the law really means, the full extent of the law. And as you read through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, you see what he's doing there. Now think too about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now we point to this as a proof of the inspiration of the Bible, which it is, but notice when Paul said that all scripture is inspired and profitable for these things, he was referring to the Old Testament, because that's all that he had at the time. The New Testament had not been written. So when he says this, he's saying the Old Testament is profitable for every good work. But now, there are changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. First, after the cross, we look back on the finished work of Christ. Old Testament believers could only look ahead in hope that God would someday provide someone to take their sins away. They knew that the blood of bulls and goats could not really take away their sins, but that their sacrifices spoke of a coming perfect sacrifice. But now, we live in the time when Christ has actually finished our redemption, our salvation. As a result, since Christ has finished his work, he has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us, so we have greater power than Old Testament believers did. Now, the Holy Spirit was always present in the Old Testament. There could not have been any true believers if there hadn't been. But he is present in more power today. We also have a greater motive for obedience in the New Testament. Christ has given himself. He has sacrificed, ultimately, himself for us. This should increase our gratitude for his work. We know what Christ suffered for us, and so we should be motivated to faithfully serve him. Now, there are some changes in how the Old Testament law applies to us today. We don't just look at Old Testament laws and try to follow them exactly the same way. For one thing, we live in a different culture, and so the principles of the law apply differently. For example, Deuteronomy 22.8 says, When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet, or a railing, for your roof, that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. Now, in that day, their houses had flat roofs. And people would go up on the roof, like for entertainment or uh, for meals, that type of thing. So people were up on the roof, and you had to build a fence around the roof to protect people up there. Now this verse doesn't mean, then, that we have to build fences around our roofs today. I mean, we don't go up on the roof for entertainment. But the principle is we protect people who are on our property. So if we have a deck, we build a railing around it. We put fences around swimming pools. We do other things to keep people safe on our property. That's the principle of this law, but applied in a different culture. In the same way, Old Testament Israel was an agricultural society, and so there are a lot of laws dealing with crops and animals. We don't necessarily follow these exactly, unless we might live on a farm, and even then we might do some things differently. But we look at the principles involved in these case laws, 
and apply those principles to our own situation. Remember, that's what we talked about when we talked about case laws or casuistry. You see, the Old Testament was not an exhaustive manual of civil laws. Instead, God gave examples of how to apply the Ten Commandments in particular situations or cases. And the people were to discern the principles of those examples and then apply them to other situations. So we do the same thing. We look at the cases that God gives as examples. We discern the underlying principles, or what the Westminster Confession of Faith calls the general equity of the law, and we apply those principles to our situations. Now, another point of difference now in the New Covenant is that there is no longer a single holy political nation like Israel was. You see, God had called Israel as his special nation among all the nations of the world. And so there were some laws which applied to that situation. For example, you couldn't sell your land permanently. I think the dietary laws of the Old Testament, such as not eating pork, were part of this. These were to teach the nation of Israel that they were separate from the other nations. There's nothing wrong with pork in itself. Just because God declared it unclean for them, they were not to eat it. But since God's kingdom is not now tied to a specific nation, but it's worldwide, those distinctions have been done away. That's the significance of Peter's experience in Acts 10 when he was told to eat all kinds of unclean animals. And the application he saw was that the nations were no longer to be considered unclean. Since God's redemptive work now applies to the whole world and is not centered on the nation of Israel, those dietary laws no longer apply in the same way. Finally, we no longer offer sacrifices in the way they did in the Old Testament. Now, in one sense, we still do come to God with a sacrifice, for we're told that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, Hebrews 9.22. But in the New Covenant time, the sacrifice we bring is the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ, not of animals. So we don't bring animal sacrifices anymore, since Christ has made the perfect and complete sacrifice for sins. So to summarize, we live our Christian life in terms of the law of God. The Bible gives us rules for what we may and may not do, and we have to follow those. As a former pastor of mine used to say, we are New Covenant Christians, but we are not New Testament Christians. We are whole Bible Christians. That is, we live under the New Covenant, the covenant instituted by Christ. We no longer live under the shadows of the Old Covenant. But we do not limit ourselves to following the New Testament. We live according to all the Word of God in the entire Bible. So in our next video, we'll look particularly at how the New Testament writers Paul and James viewed the law. Some people believe they contradicted each other. So we'll look at that issue in the next video.